on this Wednesday night calls for sweeping changes to policing. He didn't deserve to die over $20. The message George Floyd's brother delivered to U.S. lawmakers. Is that what a black man is worth? The RCMP commissioner on racism in the force. But I've been struggling with the definition of systemic racism. Plus, are armed police always the answer? Calls for a change in response to mental health crises. COVID-19 testing reliability, why a negative result doesn't mean you aren't infected. And 34 years later, a murder case finally closed. It's often compared with the assassination of JFK. Police say they know who killed Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palma, but can't lay charges. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. In the span of just two weeks, there's been a transformation in the discussion around racial injustice and policing in the United States and around the world, all of it driven by the reaction to the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. In Washington today, lawmakers began hearings on a proposal for sweeping legislation to improve policing, eliminate racial profiling and police brutality. The first witness was Philonis Floyd, who just yesterday buried his brother, George. I'm tired. I'm tired of pain. Pain you feel when you watch something like that. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to for your whole life, die, die begging for his mom. I'm here to ask you to make it stop. Issues of racism and policing are on the agenda here in Canada, too. Global News asked the commissioner of the RCMP today whether she thinks there's systemic racism in her force. Here's how she responded. I don't, to say systemically that we have racism, I think systemically there's racism in, in most organizations. Um, and I don't think the RCMP is immune to that. We'll hear more from the RCMP commissioner in just a moment. First, though, Jackson Prosco on the calls in Washington to make policing part of the solution and not the problem. Less than 24 hours after George Floyd was laid to rest... What do you hope to tell the committee today? His brother, Philonis, faced lawmakers in Washington, pressing them to ensure a lasting legacy comes from this moment of national grief. It is on you to make sure his death is not in vain. After two weeks of protest, the first hearing on police reform took a hard look at the treatment of black Americans. We must acknowledge that law enforcement's past contains institutional racism, injustices, and brutality. There were questions about how far to go as calls to defund police grow louder. Angela Underwood Jacobs' brother, a federal officer, was killed as protests turned violent last week in California. It is a ridiculous solution to proclaim that defunding police departments is a solution to police brutality and discrimination. Because it's not a solution. The debate is raging across the U.S. In Minneapolis, where George Floyd died, the police chief suddenly called off contract negotiations with his officers. The city has already voted to dismantle its police force. I plan to bring in subject matter experience and advisors to conduct a thorough review of how the contract can be restructured. In New York, where 350 members of the NYPD were injured in days of violent protests, and where an officer was just charged with assault for pushing a protester, the police union lashed out. Stop treating us like animals and thugs, and start treating us with some respect. We've been left out of the conversation. We've been vilified. It's disgusting. Back in Washington, the Trump administration is reportedly weighing an executive order on police reform that could bolster legislation proposed by Democrats, all aimed at improving police accountability. If officers know they have immunity, they act with impunity. In this moment of reckoning, few dispute the need for change. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Here in Canada, the Deputy Prime Minister was asked about systemic racism in police forces here. This is what she said. It is very important for all federal government institutions, including the police, 
to operate from an understanding that systemic racism is a problem for us here in Canada, to not be complacent about that, and we have to work together against it. Our Ottawa bureau chief put the same question to the RCMP commissioner and got a different answer. Mercedes Stevenson joins me now. Mercedes, what did Brenda Lucky tell you? Well, Donna, it's an important question for the RCMP, and it was clear that the commissioner was struggling to answer it. She says it's something she thinks a lot about. Listen to what she had to say. You know, it, it's a question I haven't been struggling with, but I've been struggling with the definition of st systemic racism. And I, when I think of unconscious bias, there is unconscious bias in the RCMP, most definitely. And there is, um, you know, we live in a society where the inequities persist and police are part of that society. I think systemically there's racism in in most organizations um, and I don't think the RCMP is immune to that. Donna, I asked the commissioner what she says to Indigenous leaders who say that they do believe there is systemic racism and that it's a significant issue in the RCMP. This was her response to whether Indigenous leaders are wrong when they say systemic racism is a problem for the police. One thing I do think they're wrong about is our our will and our ability to change. Because this is a moment, a big time in history, and a big time for police to step it up. And the bar is set high, but so are my expectations for my organization. Mercedes, without video evidence of police brutality playing out, we rarely know about it. You asked the commissioner about the incident in Nunavut recently, the man being deliberately knocked over by the door of a police vehicle. What did she say? Well, exactly to your point, Donna, what happens when there's not video and concerns about how police officers are behaving? We asked her what she thought when she was able to view this video that shocked so many Canadians. This is the commissioner's response. We look at that, that type of incident and I say to myself, I need to go back, backwards and say, do our members have the right training? Do our policies and procedures fall in line? What circumstances, how did that happen? Um, we have, like our commanding officer in the North has mentioned in a, in a previous interview, we have members who are working around the clock and I'm not saying that's an excuse, but I'm just trying to find how this can happen. If she does think it's a few bad apples and not systemic racism, does she have the authority to get rid of those bad apples? Well, and that's such an important question, Donna, because police accountability is fundamental to trust. And the commissioner does say that she is concerned about maintaining Canadians' trust in the organization and wants to continue to increase that. I asked her how much power she has to hold officers to account, and this is what she had to say about firing them. Uh, we have a range of disciplinary actions that range from operational guidance to dismissal. So we, I do already have those powers. Do you think you should use them more often? Well, each case is taken on its own merit. We look at the aggravating and the mitigating factors. And uh, we have in the past, uh, we average on approximately 17 to 20 members a year that, are, uh, that leave the force because of their actions. And Donna, that issue of trust and accountability, so important all across Canada, especially in Indigenous communities that have seen a fractured relationship with the RCMP. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. There are calls to defund the police, and that involves a range of ideas, including reallocating police funding to other agencies that might be better trained and prepared to respond to crises involving mental health and substance abuse. As Ross Lord reports, there's lots of evidence armed officers aren't always what's needed. Some details of their deaths remain unclear, but Regis Korczynski Paquette in Toronto and Chantal Moore in Edmonston, New Brunswick share a tragic distinction. The young women died eight days apart after police were called in to check on their state of mind at a time of distress. Korczynski Paquette fell from an apartment balcony. Police say Moore died after she threatened an officer with a knife and he responded by shooting her. Social justice advocates say the tragedies underscore the need for a change in who responds to those calls. By making a shift and saying, well, no, the people who we want to deploy in circumstances where people might be in a mental health crisis are helping professionals, you know, uh, mental health professionals, social workers, ambulance attendants, you know, 
um, counselors. A national police union suggests its members are reluctant participants. The Canadian Police Association says the movement in recent decades to take people struggling with mental health out of institutions forced police to respond to more calls. It was not something that we were uh, trained to be involved in to the extent that we become involved in it. The group, which represents 60,000 police officers across the country, says in recent years there's been improvement in mandatory training and awareness and in de-escalating volatile situations. But the association admits the mere presence of a uniformed armed officer sometimes escalates the situation. You will have people showing up to deal with these issues, particularly if we know that the person's in the mental health crises, not wearing a uniform. All of our outreach teams that specifically focus on mental health in the community don't wear a uniform. In both the Moore and Korchinski paquette tragedies, officers who responded were in uniform. It might be impossible to ever know what, if any, impact that had on the outcomes, but advocates say sending people trained primarily to project and exercise authority is not an effective arrangement. Ross Lohr, Global News, Windsor, Nova Scotia. One of the latest targets of those angry about oppression and racial inequality is the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. The statue of Columbus was toppled by demonstrators in Richmond, Virginia. It was draped in a burning American flag, covered in red paint and dumped in a lake. Other statues of Columbus who sailed across the Atlantic from Spain in 1492 have been beheaded. Critics say his visit to the U.S. is what spearheaded the transatlantic slave trade and led to European colonization of indigenous people. Cops, a popular but controversial TV show, has been cancelled. Last week, Paramount Network temporarily pulled the program as scrutiny on police use of force reached a tipping point. Yesterday, the network confirmed there are no plans to bring it back. COPS debuted in 1989 and has been criticized for glorifying arrests and selectively editing footage in favor of the police. Its producers have also been accused of coercing suspects of crimes into signing waivers to appear on television. The main test for COVID-19 put to the test. Coming up, why and when the tests could be ineffective. Ontario Premier Doug Ford and two members of his cabinet have been tested for COVID-19. The Education Minister, Stephen Lecce, was first to be tested. He says he came into contact with someone who had the virus. Lecce says his test has come back negative. Out of an abundance of caution, Premier Ford and Health Minister Christine Elliott also got tested. They're still waiting for their results and didn't appear at the media briefing today. Ford's nephew, Toronto City Councillor Michael Ford, has revealed he's tested positive for COVID-19. The Premier's office says the two have not come into contact with each other in the past 14 days. A negative test does not guarantee you aren't infected with the virus. A lot depends on when exactly you are tested. Doing it too soon can give a false negative. And as Abigail Beeman explains, that has big implications as we open up the economy. A disinfectant plus sanitizer is what we're using now. Some Ontario restaurants are preparing to reopen patios Friday. With that, as owner Ivan Geds knows, comes an increased risk of transmission. You know, I've had to ask people to leave sometimes because they've overconsumed. It's going to be the same sort of jam. If somebody's not taking that seriously, they're not abiding by those sort of things, they got to leave because the health and safety of our staff um, is incredibly important. And new research out of Johns Hopkins University suggests more people could be walking around sick than we think, showing the main type of coronavirus testing produces at least one in five false negatives. On infection day one, a test is completely ineffective. By day five, when symptoms typically start, the false negative rate hits 38%. That drops to 20% by day eight before climbing back up. You have someone where you really think they have a, a high probability of being infected, you shouldn't just kind of um, rest easy once you have the negative test result. Having these kind of results suggests that, you know, we are definitely missing part of the picture. 
Virologist Benoit Barbeau says so much is still unknown about COVID-19, and there are so many variables. Until we can find a better standardized test, people should get tested more than once. Coupled with false negatives, the mystery of asymptomatic transmission. The World Health Organization forced to walk back comments that asymptomatic people posed little to no risk, now saying the science isn't settled. They're out there for sure. We cannot detect them. They don't know that they're infected. Uh, they might represent uh, 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 an important element in the spreading of the virus. Keep all this in mind as provinces take more reopening steps, but Barbeau says it shouldn't stop people from living more normal lives. Geds isn't worried about people staying home out of fear. We have no doubt we'll be full. It's about managing those people. He's more worried about people not taking the pandemic seriously enough. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Some good news for families whose loved ones live in long-term care homes in Nova Scotia. As of June 15th, visitors will be allowed again. The visits must take place outside, though. Visitors will be screened. People must keep two meters apart and non-medical masks must be worn. The Premier says it's a start. Now, I know this is not exactly what you were hoping for, and we understand you're craving for that long-awaited hug. We're not there yet, but sitting in the fresh air and a visit with your loved one is a good first step. Nova Scotia reported no new cases of COVID-19 today and only five active cases of the virus. Canada gets called out ahead. Greta Thunberg sends her complaints to the UN. Watching Global National. There's an update tonight on that humpback whale found dead after swimming up the St. Lawrence River to Montreal. Quebec researchers pulled it from the water and say they found early evidence the whale may have been hit by a boat. The whale had some signs of uh, trauma, so uh, hematoma on the, on the under the, the skin and on the on the muscle. Uh, accumulation of blood, which is actually suggestive of a trauma by a boat. Researchers say its stomach was empty. They're hoping a full necropsy will explain exactly why it died. Climate activist Greta Thunberg, known for castigating world leaders on climate change, is calling out Canada. The 17-year-old signed a letter from youth activists and climate scientists. They're urging UN ambassadors from small island states to push Canada and Norway to commit to no new oil and gas exploration or production and to phase out existing production. The letter says, we believe candidates for election to the Security Council must recognize the climate emergency and be committed to act based on the best available climate science. The group says Canada pays lip service to climate change but keeps expanding fossil fuel production and subsidizing oil companies. Canada is going up against Norway and Ireland for the two seats available in next week's election to the UN Security Council. To win, they need the backing of two-thirds of UN member nations. Case closed for Sweden's murder mystery next. Why the killer's been named but not punished. Warm wishes are pouring in for Prince Philip today on his 99th birthday. To mark the milestone, Buckingham Palace released a new photo of the Duke of Edinburgh and Queen Elizabeth. They are longevity personified. They've been married for 72 years. It was taken at Windsor Castle where the couple are isolating during the pandemic. They celebrated with video calls to family and the palace released some other family photos today revealing some candid moments of their long life together, including their royal visit to Canada in 1951. For 34 years, a high-profile murder mystery has intrigued Sweden. Tonight, the death of a former Prime Minister, Olaf Palma, is case closed. Palma was shot back in 1986 while he was walking home from the movies with his wife, with no security detail. More than 100 people were suspected of committing the crime. Today, officials revealed the man they say pulled the trigger, prompting a sense of relief and frustration. Crystal Gamansing reports on why it could generate a whole new round of conspiracy theories. He was a social democrat who spoke critically of the U.S. over the Vietnam War and called apartheid in South Africa a politically gruesome system. 
Olaf Palma had enemies, and the hunt to find his killer has been as notorious in Sweden as his assassination. This is one of the biggest police investigations in the world. It's often compared with the assassination of JFK and even also with the Lopkabi bombing. Speaking through an interpreter, the head investigator and chief prosecutor shared news the world has been waiting decades to hear. They identified this man, Stig Enstrom, as the shooter. He worked at an insurance company on the same street where the shooting took place. He put himself front and center, claiming to be a witness. Palma was shot in the back at point-blank range, and there were apparently several witnesses. But authorities didn't present any evidence connecting Enstrom to the murder. I feel confident about our conclusions, but uh, I will not have the possibility to, to present it to a court. There won't be a trial. Enstrom ended his own life in 2000. Previously, it was thought that Krister Patterson was the killer. His conviction was overturned partly because of a lack of evidence. The killing has been shrouded in rumor and speculation. Conspiracy theories involve everything from South African security forces to rogue Swedish police with far-right beliefs. It national trauma. A national trauma is how the current prime minister described Palma's assassination, adding he hopes the wound can now heal. Sweden lost more than a top political figure, father and husband on that February night. Palma and his wife had no security. The feeling was that the streets were so safe, even the prime minister could go for a late night stroll after a movie. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's year Canada is the village of Harris, Saskatchewan, incorporated in 1909. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.